Good afternoon, and welcome to Gates Presbyterian Church on this joyous occasion. We're uh, glad that you could join us, those in the sanctuary and those who are watching from home. Uh, in a time that seems long ago, before Zoom was a word that we used every day, we found ourselves in need of a new pastor. So I was uh, honored to work with a great group of people in uh, searching for that pastor. Lost my place. Uh, God's ways were not at all as serious in this instance as Laura was clearly the right choice for us. So after a two-year engagement, we're ready to proceed with vows and oaths and promises. Um, I will share with you that as of two minutes ago, the, bar the bill score was 14-14. <laughs> and um, would ask you if your cell phones are not silenced to do so now. We're glad that you can be with us and we hope that you'll um, enjoy the spirit of the occasion and join us for the reception afterward. It's been a long time since we've been able to share fellowship and food, so please plan to stay. Thank you. We invite you to rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. We come, for God gathers us here, with that community called faith, where the hungry are served first, where the thirsty drink life's water. We come, for God welcomes us here, into that home called grace, where the naked are clothed in robes of hope, where the stranger is embraced as a long-lost prodigal. We come, for God reunites us here, siblings in that family called love, where the imprisoned model justice, where the sick are cradled in God's peace. We come, for God gathers us here. Let us worship God. Please join me in the gathering prayer. Almighty and eternal God, by your grace, you have called us to this time and place to be your servant people as we follow our servant, Lord. 
Make your Holy Spirit move within and among us, that today we have a new life as the body of Christ in the world. Bind us together in faith, so that as we receive all spiritual gifts needed to fulfill our calling, we may support one another in common ministry. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. When we pass through deep waters or go through times of fiery trial, our God is with us. With confidence in God, our Creator and Redeemer, let us confess our sins. Merciful and loving God, you have called us to be your people and claimed us for the service of Jesus Christ. We confess that we have not lived up to our calling to proclaim the good news in word and deed. We are quick to speak when we ought to listen and remain silent when it is time to speak. We put too much faith in our own actions and fail to trust the strength of your spirit. O oh God, forgive our foolish and sinful ways. Strengthen us anew to follow Christ's way in the world. By your Holy Spirit, give us the grace we need to be faithful disciples and fulfill our common calling through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Hear the good news. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God.
first scripture reading this, morning, this afternoon is from 1 Samuel 3, verses 1 through 18. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever, for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son? He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him.
The Gospel lesson is taken from the Gospel according to Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 31 through 46. Listen for the word of God. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit with you? The king will reply, truly, I tell you, whenever you did it for one of the least of these sisters or brothers of mine, you did it for me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fires prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't look after me. And they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothing or sick or in prison and didn't help you? And he will reply, Truly, I tell you, whenever you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. Then they will go to their eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of God for we who are the people of God. having more room, like a desk or something. I don't know. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> Please pray with me. Jesus, be with us. As we receive your blessing, inspired by the Spirit, inviting us anew to know you, through these words and to see you because of these words. Alleluia. Amen. Hear those verses again, 37 through 39 of Matthew 15. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked, and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? When did we see you? Once we see, we cannot unsee. Is it an old woman and a young woman, a maiden and a crone? Is it a goblet or the silhouette of two facing each other? Is it a row of lines and horizontal tabs sticking out here and there? Or is it the word Jesus? Is it the least of these? Or someone to be judged, dismissed, ignored? Once you have seen, you cannot unsee. You can't deny, you can't conveniently forget 
fear, judge, or walk on by. Indian writer Aruni Roy, who is an activist focusing on the issues related to social justice and economic inequality states, the trouble is that once you see it, you can't unsee it. And once you have seen it, keeping quiet, saying nothing, becomes as political an act as speaking out. There is no innocence. Either way, you're accountable. As people of faith, we are accountable. We say that we have seen, that we understand the gospel imperative that requires us that we not unsee. Yet this is challenging, especially when our privilege and power is threatened. We get defensive when we fear that for our personal safety or security or well-being. And we put aside the imperative with bold judgment when we are anxious or fearful or self-righteous. That's not Jesus, it's a scumbum, I once heard a pastor proclaim, which made me fear for the sheep that one was shepherding. All too often, we act like goats. Yeah, especially when we don't think we've been appreciated or respected or rewarded, or when someone we love has been given the same treatment. And still, and still, we are called to come alongside of the least of these, to accompany which is not about judgment or indoctrination or imposing values or social constructs. It's about standing with and offering what is needed for human thriving. When you offer food or water or clothing or shelter or welcome or acknowledgement of suffering, when you saw the basic human need for thriving lacking, and you responded with kindness, compassion, resources, with no strings attached, with no ex expectation of repayment, giving because you have it and another has need of it, then you have responded to the biblical mandate of Matthew 25, in contrast to the fear-based mandate of privilege and a gospel of scarcity. This is God's economy. When we use that with which we have been blessed to bless another. Sister Jose Habde, Seneca First Nation woman, a member of the Franciscan order, author and lecturer, lecturer said that this is the native way. If I have it and you have need of it, then it must belong to you. When asked about this practice and how it worked, especially if what you had you also needed, she replied, oh, like when I have 20 bucks and somebody needs 20 bucks and I know that I'm going to need that in another week so I can eat, well, then I just say to them, we have to do this the white way, as I'm going to need that back in a week. Now, this may sound like a racist statement or a judgment, Yet it is bore out of her experience of life with humanity and a long history that her people have endured with white people, especially white Christians. We have not been generous with our resources. We have not given freely. We have exacted payment, often with interest, with strings attached, with public shaming, with penalties to pay in order to repay, retain the power and the privilege that we have over those in need. Father Richard Rohr, in a homily entitled The Wedding Feast, writes these words. For many of us, the body of Christ is not a party. Instead, we often believe that heaven is like a giant courtroom. The good people win and the bad people lose. And almost everybody is bad except us in our group. That's not how it works, he says. It gives no joy and no hope to the world. It tells people they're on the right side when sometimes they're not very loving people who don't care about the poor or the marginalized at all. 
and the statistics prove that Christians are no better than anyone else. In fact, very often, I'm sorry to say, we're worse, end quote. Friends, we are the body of Christ, and all too often we function from a place of power and privilege that is codified and codified with judgment and ignorance. We have not seen because we have cast our eyes down, looked away, moved to the right neighborhood, believing the lie of the American dream that if I work hard, I will achieve in the land of the free. And we have consumed the lie of the of those who have the agenda of fear of what they do not know, nor dare to see. A lie that is built on a mo model of scarcity that believes that if we give too much, we will not have enough. Or do we choose not to see because we don't want to feel uncomfortable? Discomfort often halts us from living the gospel, as Matthew 25 invites. Because, well, you know, somebody might see that I don't have the, all, all the answers, or maybe they'll notice that I haven't sorted out all the contradictions in my life, or I may be labeled, or dissed, or dismissed. All of these things make us feel uncomfortable. And so we don't act or we just quietly write the check. We don't articulate the questions that may lead to insight, wondering out loud, for example, if something is racist. Shouldn't I just know? So I pretend rather than risk, risking vulnerability, looking uninformed, and therefore I do not grow. Should I respond to the people people who make those uninformed statements about why people are poor or about those who receive services or help through a Pell Grant through education with a truth that refutes the myth that they're perpetuating? To do so would feel uncomfortable to me and probably would make them uncomfortable too. And so I don't say anything. Should it matter? Walking in faith always matters. Yet it's not the way that things matter in our world. Living into a way of being as the people who have seen and cannot unsee will be critiqued by those who don't understand and by those who feel threatened. There we, therefore, we need to seek others out others who will join us what does it look like to live as those people who have seen and cannot unsee? Well, we in the Presbyterian Church have challenged ourselves as, as through the Matthew 25 initiative to focus our sights on building vital communities in congregations, dismantling structural racism, eradicating systematic poverty. And how do we live as those people who have seen and cannot unsee? We love authentically because we were loved first, because we see Jesus in all whom we encounter. Seek activist, filmmaker, civil rights lawyer, and mother, Valerie Kaur, describes living this kind of love in her book, See No Stranger. Love is a form of sweet labor, fierce, bloody, imperfect, and life-giving, a choice we make over and over again. Love as labor can be taught, modeled, and practiced. This labor engages all of our emotions. Joy is the gift of love. Grief is the price of love. Anger protects that which is love. And when we think we have reached our limit, wonder is the act that returns us to love. Revolutionary love is choice to labor for others, for our op opponents, for ourselves, in order to transform the world around us. So Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? 
When did we see you, a stranger, and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? When? When we see Jesus in the face of another, the one who makes us uncomfortable. And we learn to breathe into the reality of being uncomfortable. For when we are weary and resentful, uncomfortable, God provides not only enough for us, God provides enough for all. In giving, we not only share our resources, but we find all that we need to serve another. Beloved, blessed, blessed are those who have seen and therefore cannot unsee, for they have seen Jesus, and they have the grace and the mercy to be Jesus in a world that needs more love, more joy, more Jesus. Alleluia. Amen.
Please stand in body or spirit as you are able for the affirmation of faith. <clears throat> we trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image to live as one community. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. A litany of gifts comes from Romans 12, verses 4 through 8, 11 through 13. As in one body, we have many parts, and each part has its own function. So all of us together with Christ are one body, and we all belong to each other. We have different gifts according to the grace God has given us. If your gift is to hear God's word, it's out in faith. If your gift is service, live to serve others. If your gift is the heart of a teacher, teach what is true. Let preachers preach with conviction and givers give freely. Let leaders work diligently for the people and let those who serve the poor serve gladly. Let us not lack for enthusiasm, but be ardent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient supporting one another and welcoming all. We are all called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, and as ministers of word and sacrament. All are called to live out God's love in the world. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion in the world, for the ordering and governance of the church, and for the preaching of the word and celebration of the sacraments. God's call to this ministry has been affirmed through the congregation, accepted by the candidate and approved by the Presbytery. Therefore, the Presbytery of Genesee Valley, by means of this commission, installs Laura M. Bachman as pastor of Gates Presbyterian Church. Friends, the Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise. We praise you for leading your people, Israel, through the waters of the sea, out of bondage and into freedom in the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your Son, who for us was baptized in the waters of the Jordan and was anointed as the Christ by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from the bondage of sin and death and give us cleansing and rebirth. We praise you for pouring out your Holy Spirit, which us and leads us into all the truth, filling us with a variety of gifts that we might proclaim the gospel to all nations serve you as the body of Christ in the world. We rejoice that you have claimed us in our baptism and anointed us for service in Christ's name, and that by your grace we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us, that we may be in 
you forever in the risen life of Christ, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. Laura, in baptism, you were claimed by the love of God, clothed in the grace of Jesus Christ, and anointed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to share Christ's mission in the world. Now you are called by God through the voice of the church for new service and ministry in Jesus' name. In accordance with the Constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA, show your commitment to this calling by responding to these questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledging him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you accept the, whole, the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ, and the church universal, and God's word to you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith, the ex as expressed in the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? I do and I will. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. I will. Will you be a faithful minister of word and sacrament, proclaiming the good news, teaching faith and caring for people? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? I Do we, the members of the church, except Laura as our pastor, chosen by God through the voice of the congregation to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we agree to pray for her, encourage her, to respect her decisions, and to follow as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? We do. Do we promise to pay her fairly and provide for her welfare as she works among us, to stand by her in trouble and share her joys? Will we listen to the words she preaches, welcome her pastoral care, and honor her authority as she seeks to honor and obey Jesus Christ our Lord? We will. Gracious and eternal God, with full hearts and elevated spirits of joy, we give you thanks and praise. We praise you for you alone are God, and because you have made each of us, and we are your people. We give thanks that throughout the ages and in every place, including here at Gates Presbyterian Church, you have chosen servants like our sister Laura from among your people to point the way to salvation and service by your grace. Over long generations, your presence has sustained your people. We're grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, as your child Laura has done, placing their trust in you alone. 
We are blessed by those who have led in righteousness and peace for prophets and apostles who, as Laura continues to do, spoke your bold words of mercy and of truth. We give thanks for leaders and teachers in every age who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. And above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ, who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. We are grateful for your servant, Laura, who follows in his footsteps, serving and proclaiming the inbreaking of your beloved community. Gracious God, we also give you thanks for your beloved child and servant, Laura, as she continues in the ministry to which you have called her in this place for such a time as this. Help her to rely on the gifts that you have given her. Help her to rely on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and to continue to follow Christ faithfully in this calling. God, we ask that you give her a, a continued and courageous spirit of truthfulness that she may proclaim your word in Christ from pulpit, table, font, on the streets, in the tent camps, under the bridges, in coffee houses, and in the words and actions of daily living. By the gifts of your sweet, sweet Holy Spirit, empower her to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, to challenge and to comfort them, to lead with compassion, vision, and courage. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, give to all of your servants gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor and courage, an abiding sense, God, of your deep, loving presence. Holy and beautiful God, bless the, the common ministry of this pastor and of these people with joy and power in the gospel. We pray that you pour out your spirit of power, truth, and love upon the whole of your church, that we all may be for you a holy people, baptized and commissioned to serve you in the world. Sustain your church. In particular, this fellowship of yours, Gates Presbyterian Church, sustain this church in your ministry. Ground each person here in the gospel. Fix your love in us. Secure our hope in Christ. Strengthen our service to the outcast. Increase our love for one another. God, show us the transforming power of your love in our life together that we may be effective servants of the gospel, offering to all a compelling witness in the world of the good news and love of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You are now a minister of word and sacrament in the Church of Jesus Christ in this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Amen. Hear these words of scripture. 11 to 18. Mary outside the tomb. And then she went to the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting with the body of Jesus. They were at the head and they were at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where to find him. I do not know where they have laid him. Having said that, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that this was Jesus. Jesus said, Why are you weeping? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried away Jesus, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to Mary, said to her, Mary, she turned, and she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, 
Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and sisters and say to them, I am sending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Mary was the apostle to the apostles, trusted to see Jesus when others could not see. Her faith had brought her to leadership. You, as the called pastor now installed, you are the promised partner in ministry for this congregation. They are the called community which you will serve. I offer to you a threefold charge to love the caring community, to love the communities of need and partnership with the caring community, and to care for yourself, to nurture the nurturer as God has called you, to be the prophetic presence among the prophetic minority of Christ Jesus. The prophet Baha'u'llah of the Baha'i faith said, so powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. I charge you to do what you know you have been trying to do and to know that you have everything that you need with God's help to complete this work. In Jesus' name. Now let us walk to the table for a time. All right, in this part of the service, we are going to present some symbols of ministry. Uh, some are old, already in service by you, Reverend Laura, and some are new. So we'll start with, um, as a representation of your regular feeding and connection to God through the sacraments, we have a chalice and paten that we'll give you. And you will recognize those as yours in service, but there are also a couple new uh, chalice and paten. I had to Google how to say paten. You're making a mess. That's okay. <laughs> as a next symbol, uh, as representing your being grounded in Scripture, uh, we have a new Bible for you and a cover to go along with it that are just for you. Sure, why not? It's really heavy. And the I word think of God is heavy. <laughs> you got that right. And there's, a, I think, a book plate on the inside, just so nobody tries to take it to from you. Yes. I'm supposed to give it away, right? Yeah. Somewhere, right? <laughs> I don't know. To protect the word. All right, the next symbol uh, represents your active work in the community. I think the scripture today, Matthew 25, was incredibly fitting 
So uh, giving back to you your well-worn shoes that are used to tread all over our community elsewhere and also a, a mask for you. And unfortunately, it's not um, steel nose covered, but you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, there we go. <laughs> In the sign of the current times. And then uh, these are all gifts from your church family. And this is from your Gates Presbyterian family um, as a gift to uh, say thanks, um, to show our faith in you, um, our gratitude for your service, and our common bond in Christ. Because you are often going to be helping people to recognize their connection to Christ in baptism, this is a gift to assist you in that. This is a shell from the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of Massachusetts. And because in caring for yourself, you will have some deserved times of peace. This is for the tree that will grace your home in the time of the celebration of the birth of Jesus. May it remind you of the gift of life and peace that you've been given and encourage you. for our place at the table, for our congregation that, that loves the table and to sing about the table. Father Richard Rohr says, there are no perfect institutions and no perfect people. There is only the struggle to be whole. And so, congregation, I charge you with the words from 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11. You are called to maintain constant love for one another. This love covers a multitude of sins. Yes, bear one another without complaining, like good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Serve one another with whatever gifts you have received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. Unto Christ belong the glory and the power forever. Amen. Blessings to this servant community. <laughs> Welcome, Laura. It is now time to um, think about our offering. We're actually not going to collect it today. We would ask you to uh, consider dropping it into one of the two offering plates on your way out of the sanctuary today. Um, the gifts offered at this time go to the Committee on the Preparation for Ministry of the Genesee Valley uh, Presbytery of Genesee Valley. Um, getting a pastor installed actually costs money. It's, it does, you know, things have to happen. And so all of the money collected today goes to help um, prepare our, our future ministers and get them um, 
installed. Uh, so thank you for your gifts for that. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Amen.
Will you pray with me? Lord, we were a pile of ash, and you made us a light for the world. We were stone, and you made us salt for the earth. We were as lifeless as clay, and you made us part of the body of Christ. We were sinful, and you made us holy. We were nothing, and you made us part of everything. Lord, in you we are transformed, and transformed still again. When the discouraged cry for hope, make us hope. When the hungry cry for bread, make us bread. When the thirsty cry for water, make us water. When the suffering cry for help, make us help. When the sick cry for healing, make us healing. When the bound cry for freedom, make us freedom. When the outcasts cry for love, make us love. Lord, who is hope, who is bread and water, who is help and healing, who is freedom and who is love, transform us anew, and so keep us close to you as you transform the world. Amen. Friends, let us go out to serve together. And may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and abide with you now and always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And come to the party. And I'm told I have to go straight there. So if you want to see me, come with me.